Let's pray. Father, I thank you for, Lord, these are your people. These are your sheep. Lord, you knew this word would be shared today. Lord, I ask you you to give us eyes and ears and hearts to receive the things that you have for us today. God, we bless you. And Father, we recognize, God, from your word that uh, disappointments in our life can cause, um, can cause us to stagnate, can cause uh, other things to, that, that we don't want in our life to develop. So, Father, we thank you again for opening our eyes and our hearts to receive your word today. God, every person in this room today with a bondage, with an addiction, with a stronghold over their life, God, we declare those things are broken off of their life by the power of your word your word, your word, oh God, the anointing of your word, it destroys the yoke of bondage, addiction, and strongholds. And we declare that they're broken in Jesus' name. If you agreed with that, would you give me a hearty amen? Amen. 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 Praise God. Well, again, if you, uh, if you weren't here last week, uh, it was, uh, last weekend was Memorial Day weekend, so we know we had several families uh, that were out. Make sure that you go back and, uh, and listen, to the, listen to the message because uh, this is kind of a, a part two an addendum, kind of want to go a little bit further than I did last week with that. So, uh, but you, this one will make a whole lot more sense to you if you go back and you listen to that, that first one, and uh, it'll help you. Last week, we talked about uh, something that, that Jesus, one of the reasons that Jesus identified himself as why he came. And this was our, one of our main texts last week was John chapter 10, and it was really the second part of, of the verse. The first part talks about the thief comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. But now Jesus is going to tell us why he came. And here's what it says. I came, Jesus, Jesus talking, I came that they or that you, that's you and I, might have life. And that kind of life isn't so that we'd have air in our lungs that we'd breathe, have life. But we'd have the God kind of life. It's the, it's the Greek word zoe. It's Z-O-E. And uh, it, People pronounce it different ways. I was taught the Zoe. If you're from Southern Alamance, you may say you may call it Zoe, but it's actually closer to Zoe. That was a funny Zoe from at Southern Alamance. Okay, <clears throat> thank you, Lord. So, <clears throat> and the, the sad truth is that most believers that even know that verse and quote that verse are not living this life that Jesus came to give us. Are they born again? Yes. But he came to do more than just save us. He came that we might have life, that we might have the God kind of life, God's life, where we'd have it here and now. And people are, there's so many Christians. In fact, I would say probably most Christians are not walking in this life that's available to us. You know, they'll we'll read that verse and they'll even quote that verse. And the man, you know, God came that we might have life, you know, abundant life and live it to its fullest. But again... So many people aren't living it. They'll amen it. They'll bless, man, bless God, the abundant life, a prosperous life, a healthy life, and all of that's good. But again, we've got to understand this. This is a key to understanding the Zoe, the life of God. Listen, it's, a, it's an overflowing life. The Zoe, that life comes out of an overflowing life, an overflowing life that is active and vigorously devoted. Vigorously devoted to God. Now, does that sound familiar to any kind of similar? That's our vision. That's what we believe that God's called us to do is to connect people with God. And when we say connect people with God, we're talking about helping them find, find him and get connected and get born again. But that's not all. We don't want to just stop there because Jesus told us in the Great Commission to go make disciples. That's followers. And so when we're talking, we're talking about making people who are Fully devoted, you hear that a lot, fully devoted, or what we just said this morning, vigorously devoted to God. Out of that is what comes the abundant life. And honest to God, that's why a lot of Christians that are saved, but they're not experiencing the life of God, and they never will on this side of heaven. They'll experience it when they get to heaven, but he's, God has made it so that we can experience days of heaven here on the earth now. But look at this verse again. I want you to look at it again. John 10, verse 10, second part, Jesus says this, I came that, watch this, they may have. He came that you may have. Guess what? You may not have. But he came that we may have <clears throat> an abundant life. The, uh, the New Living Translation says this, my purpose or my intention is to give them a rich and satisfying life. That's his intention. He intends to do that. Have you ever, you, you, can you imagine if, if I said that, uh, hey, I, I tell somebody, hey, go down to, uh, go down to uh, Stearns Ford. Hey, get a clue, kind of what, what, what's happening to Stearns Ford. Hey, go to Stearns Ford. I've got something there. It's paid for. All you got to do is go pick it up. 
this is my intention. I'm giving this to you. I want, I want you to have it. Da, 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 da. Go by and pick it up. Well, let's say I call a guy that I know there, and I say, hey, hey, Larry, did, uh, did so-and-so ever come back? I never heard anything back from him. I would have thought that maybe they would have called and said, hey, man, thank you. This is awesome. But I never heard anything from him. So I called him, hey, did so-and-so ever come by? He said, no, they never did. Well, listen, my intention was to give them that. God's intention, his purpose, the reason he came was to, to give us this abundant life. But we don't have to go down and get it. How many of you parents, you, have an in, you had an intention to bless your children? Boy, you had some good things planned. You were going to do something. But boy, you found out something they did at school. Or they did something at home. They did something, da, da, da. And, and you, 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 can't, you can't give it to them now. You don't want to give it to them. You, don't want to, you, you have to withhold that. Until there's an adjustment made in their life. Do you understand what I'm saying? And it's all, oh, no, I'm going to go ahead and give it to them anyway. Well, you're welcome to be, be a bad parent if you want to. <laughs> but sometimes we have to withhold. God withholds things from us at times. You know, if you look in, in, in Malachi chapter 3 where it's talking about the tithe, God was, was scolding the children of Israel through the prophet Malachi. And he said, he said, I have this against you. He said, you're robbing me. And they said, how are we robbing you? He said, you're robbing me in the tithes and offerings. It wasn't tithe offering. It was tithes. The tithe, tithe means 10% tenth, tenth of their income belongs to the Lord. It's the Lord's. It's his. It's not ours. And we, we give it to him. We bring it to him. It's his. And then there's offerings that they gave throughout the year, different offerings that they were, they were prescribed to give. He said, you're robbing me of that. And God says, listen, he says, test me in this. Test me and see if you will not, if you'll bring the tithe in, test me. I'll pour out blessings in your life that you don't have room enough to receive it. See, his intention is to bless, but sometimes we don't go down and we don't receive it. Sometimes our life, or our act of disobedience, we can't receive those blessings. You think about the life of, of, of Abraham. Listen to what the Bible says in, in Genesis 22, verse 16. Uh, and again, remember Abraham had a son named Isaac, and he was the promised, he was the promised one. He was the one that they was born in, in their old, 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 old age. And here's what it says in verse 16. It says, because you obeyed me. God's talking to Abraham. Because you obeyed me. He told him to take his son Isaac to a mountain and sacrifice him. And then when he did, he took the wood, the fire, the knife, and he started to slay his son. And the, Bible, and the, and the angel of the Lord spoke and said, Abraham, Abraham, don't hurt your son now. Now I know. Now I know that you have not withheld him. You have not put him before me. He says, because, because you've obeyed me, you've not withheld your son, your only son. I swear by my own name, I will certainly bless you. I will multiply your descendants beyond the numbers like the stars in the sky and the sands on the sea. Because Abraham obeyed, he put himself in that position to receive from God. So we put ourselves in a position to receive the abundant life, to walk in the blessing of the abundant life when we are devoted to God. Hello? Amen? Amen. So last week we talked about this. We talked about some, I call them poisons. Poisons that will rob us. They'll steal the quality of life it wants to give us. And there's, there's relational, I call them relational poisons and circumstantial poisons. The relational poisons were resentment and bitterness and jealousy and anger in relationships. God has brought relationships, brings people into our lives and takes us into other people's lives so that we can be a blessing to them and they can be a blessing to us. But sometimes we get disappointed in something that they did or something that they didn't do that we thought that they should have done. And we get disappointed and disappointment sometimes will birth that resentment and bitterness and it'll rob that quality of that relationship that God wants. Circumstantial uh, poisons are, that'll rob the quality of our life sometimes is sickness, disease, and oppression, and poverty. So those things, again, will rob and take away the quality of life that God wants us to have. So I got some other things that I want to share with you that I wanted to share last week, but I ran out of time. And really, this is the, this is the beauty of pastoring, is when you run out of time, guess what? I'll be back next week. And we can go on a little bit further. That's what we're going to do today. You know, like when uh, John George or Philip Slaughter or Tyron, when we have them in, they're usually here for a service. Buddy, they got to get it all in in one message because they're gone. But Pastor, I got you all the time. But listen, this right here, this was an aha moment when I came to understand this, that disappointment is a primary tool of the devil to undermine my determination and my momentum in pursuing the will of God. He wants to stop me, and he doesn't want me on a, on a I, mean, I mean, just going high. And fortunately, I think for me, it's, it's a good place to be. I am, I am a middle-of-the-road kind of guy. I'm never the kind of guy that's, I'm just not like on top, you know, that really emotional kind of guy. And I'm never really, you know, Eeyore. It's my party. See all the presents, all the people. I'm never down there like that. I'm just kind of a middle-of-the-road kind of a person. But again, uh, the, the enemy, his purpose 
in, in, in disappointment and using it as a tool is to cause us to stagnate in our walk with God. Oftentimes we think that his ultimate, you know, because the thief comes to steal, to kill, and destroy, he wants to kill us. But ultimately, really, a dead Christian doesn't bother him, can't hurt him. But a lukewarm Christian, because a lukewarm Christian is a bad advertisement for a great God. And if, you know, if somebody is, man, they're, they're excited, they're always preaching, they're always teaching, and I mean, they're living a great life for people that they work with in the, in the workplace, and people know them, and when they have problems, they can come to them. If all of a sudden, man, they're stagnant in their walk, people notice that. I thought you said this, I thought you taught this, I thought you believed this. Again, it's not that things aren't going to come and, and attacks aren't going to come, and we, we have to fake everything, but again, we understand we know how to walk out of things, too. So it's important that we understand that. And I noticed, I, I really, I, I noticed this a while back in my life when, when something would happen or somebody would say something to, really not so much towards me, but somebody that I loved, somebody that I cared about. They would do things, and I know it, that I would begin to get a, it would be a disappointed that they said that, and I would de- begin to develop a resentment towards that person. And, you know, and just bitter, began to be bitter towards that. And again, that's, that was robbing me of a lot of things, not just a relationship, but it was robbing me of, of having God's best in my life. So as you read, um, <clears throat> so again, it, it, all, a lot of times all these things will start, starts with a disappointment. Again, remember, Jesus was touched by disappointment. Uh, people responded to him. They, they accused him falsely of, of doing things, of being demon-possessed and doing miracles by demonic powers, and his own disciples let him down from time to time. But he didn't respond to disappointments again like we often find ourselves doing. So we saw this, that Paul, he showed us some things from Philippians 3.13 to, to kind of help us to get through disappointment. Here's some of his advice. We, we talked about this last week. Forgetting those things which are behind. Sometimes we just have to get to the place of, of we forgive but it's sometimes, I think it's easier sometimes to forgive than it is to forget. Because, again, we've always got that, that, that the enemy sitting out up here speaking to us from outside. Holy Spirit speaks to us from here. The, the devil speaks to us from out here and whispers things and says things and thoughts and reminds us of what people did, reminds us of what they didn't do, reminds us of what they said. And so he constantly keeps that. But, again, when we, we've forgiven it. We just have to remind him, hey, they're forgiven. Remember this statement. You, can, you, 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 can't, you, can, you can't keep a bird from flying over your head. I guess you can if you go in the house, but sometimes birds get in the house, <laughs> right? <laughs> you can't keep a bird from flying over your head, but you can keep them from building a nest in your hair. And that's what the enemy, you can't, he's going to throw things at you. He's going to bring back things at you, but you don't have to sit there and dwell on it. In other words, build a nest on it and let it, let it sit there for all that time. Something else that we learned from the life of Moses was, was a valuable lesson. An incredibly valuable lesson. Can you imagine leading a, a group of people and up to, up to possibly 3 million people, having a church of 3 million people? They were obstinate. They were always murmuring, always complaining, always trying to overthrow you. Can you imagine what Moses must have, must have faced like that? Listen, as soon as they came out of the, uh, across the Red Sea, their encampment, Moses goes up to the mountain, uh, and he receives the Ten Commandments up there. And while he's up there, God says, man, you're a people. <laughs> Isn't it interesting? God's done with them. God says, they're done. They say, your people, they're down there, they've made a false god, and they're worshiping that. And when Moses came down, he found that to be true. Did you realize as you read this in Exodus 32, God says, I'm done, I'm going to wipe them out. And Moses said, God, no, 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 you can't do that. He said, because you said, you told, you know, Moses said before all the people of Egypt, says, you're taking us out of the promised land. They'll say, you just brought us out here to kill us. That's the kind of God he is. You can't do this. So God says, all right, I won't. But there was a lot of bad stuff that happened, plague, and other things that took the life. But anyway, I encourage you to read, read that. But again, they, 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 they designed this uh, false god to worship and said, this is the god who brought us out, out of Egypt. But here's the thing. Here's the thing that, that I love about Moses' life. Something that I, I, I glean from him is this. Moses never forgot who it was he worked for. He never forgot who it is he worked for. Never forget who it is that you work for. Uh, if, if whenever we do that, if we ever reason, if Moses, if Moses ever reasoned that it was the people he was doing this for, he would have quit. He would have walked off less, but he knew, he knew that this was from God. So if, if we ever conclude this, that, that what you're doing, and when you're serving here in the church, you're serving in the nursery, you're serving out there in, when it's cold, you're serving out there in the parking lot when it's blistering hot, if you ever figure you're doing this for people, you'll quit. If you ever feel like on your job you're doing this for your boss, you're doing this for the company, you'll get disappointed when things don't go your way. So never, ever, never, ever, never forget who it is, who it is that we work for. 
You know, there was a, a, a pastor, uh, he got busy, he got busy one week, and uh, during the week, and he didn't, he didn't, he didn't uh, go by the hospital, he didn't see, he had some of his people in there, and uh, this is a, this is a way back, this is back when pastors wore suits. Y'all remember that? Remember when pastors used to wear suits? And uh, so he goes, to, he decided, you know, on Sunday after church, he told his family, he said, hey, I'm going to go by the hospital, I'm going to see some of our people. And he went there, and, uh, you know, two of them had been discharged already. Two of them were asleep, had signs on their, on their uh, room, you know, please do not disturb. Uh, two others of them, there were seven of them, two others of them, uh, he went in, there was lots of people in the room, and he kind of felt like he was intruding in there. You ever been like that? You kind of go in, everybody's talking, laughing and stuff, and you walk in, everything gets caught because the preacher's here or somebody that's representing the church. And then the last one, he went in to, to see her, and she was complaining and bemoaning about why she was sick and blaming it on God, saying God ain't doing nothing in her life. So when he left the building, you know, when he left the hospital, you know, he felt like, ugh, I felt like he wasted his time. So he's going down. There's an office building. This is a true story. He's going down. He goes down. There was this, it was on Sunday, so this building is closed, but it had a little guard house, and there was a guard sitting out there in a uniform. And he walked up, and he says, and when he walked by him, he says, he says uh, it's closed today, isn't it? He says, yeah. He says, what are you out here doing? He said, well, you know, they hire me to guard against, uh, make sure nobody breaks in and nobody combines, comes by and vandalizes the building. I said, oh, okay. And then the guard asked him this. He said, well, you know, you, you dressed up pretty nice today. He says, who, who are you and who do you work for? And uh, he started to tell him his name, but he reached in his pocket and he gave him his business card. He said, this is my business card. He said, uh, it was the church, it was the church business card. He said, here's my business card with my phone number on it, my name and my phone number. He said, if you'll... Uh, he said, if you'll call me every Monday morning, I'll pay you $15. If you'll call me, just ask me that question. Who are you and who do you work for? And remind me to ask myself that. Who do I work for? So that's something I think we need to remind ourselves sometimes. Who is it that we do all of our th the things that we do for? Listen to what it says in Colossians chapter 3, verse 23. Whatever you do, work at it with all of your heart, working as for the Lord and not for men. That's what Paul said to the church at Colossae. He said almost the same thing to the church at, at Ephesus. He said, serve wholeheartedly as you're serving the Lord, not men. So when we're tempted to get bitter because of a disappointment, because of, again, if somebody didn't do something, we didn't receive the, the acknowledgement that maybe we felt like that we should have got, we felt like we, we were overworked and underpaid, again, we need to be sure to remind ourselves, who is this that I'm really doing this for? Is it for a paycheck? Is it for a boss? Is it for an employer? Again, is it for the church? Is it for the pastor? It's got to be unto God. Our sense of integrity. You know, God sees everything that we do. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 10 says, God is not unaware of those things that you're doing. All of those good things and bad things. But God sees when you're giving your heart and you're, you're working with integrity and you're working as unto the Lord, God sees that and he knows that. You know, there was a man that he was, he was visiting his, his, uh, his wife he'd been married to for a number of years. Now she was in a nursing home, uh, was suffering with the last stages of Alzheimer's. She didn't know who he was, didn't know when he came, when he left, or anything like that. And somebody asked him one day, they said, you know, why do you, why do you go see her? Why do you keep going to see her every day? She doesn't even know who you are. And he looked at him and says, I know who I am, and I'm her husband. Don't forget who you are. There's times that we want to quit. Who's the boss? Who's the leader? Sometimes we want to quit jobs. Sometimes we want to quit churches. Who's the boss? Who tells us when we can go? Does God place us? Do we pray? Do we pray about that job? Do we ask God to open this door for us? And all of a sudden we get in there and it's not exactly what we thought it was. And then we decide to leave. Is that okay if God gave us that job? You know, Paul told Timothy, you know, stir yourself up. You know, there's people I know that sometimes they'll complain about the, the church. I'm not getting fed, or I'm not doing this, or isn't it meet my need? The worship doesn't, they don't sing the songs that I like. Who are we doing this for? You know, Paul told Timothy, he said, Timothy, stir yourself up. Stir up those gifts that are on the inside of you. Stir yourself up. See, Timothy was a pastor, and he had kind of gotten down, and, and he, Paul told him, said, look, man, God's not giving you a spirit of fear but a power and love and the sound mind. Stir those gifts up on the inside of you. He said, there was gifts that were imparted to you through the laying on of hands. He said, I was there. I was one of the ones. I saw, I saw gifts being imparted to you. Stir those gifts up on the inside of you. And sometimes we need to stir ourselves up. The Bible says that we, we build ourselves up when we pray in the Holy Ghost, Jude verse 20. So over the last two weeks, again, what have we learned? Let's look back. Every one of us are going to face disappointment. <clears throat> Every one of us. We're going to face disappointments in life. What did Paul teach us? He taught us that resurrection power resides on the inside of us. Every one of us, if you're a born-again Christian, the Bible says that the same power that raised Christ Jesus from the dead, 
That was God's greatest display of power ever seen when he raised Christ from the dead. And that same power resides on the inside of you if you're born again. And you can overcome anything with that power on the inside of you. He taught us to let go. Let go, forgetting those things which lie behind. He taught us to press on, press through for the prize, for the high calling of God in Christ Jesus in our life. And something else that Paul did, as great as Paul was, he, hadn't, he said, I'm not a got there yet. I'm not a got there yet. I'm not a got there yet. He said, I have not achieved. I'm not a got there. I like that. Moses, again, never let us forget who was boss. Never let us forget who he works at. One more thing I want to mention today, and that's this. Is this is the, how important in overcoming uh, disappointment and walking above that is the element of faith. We must have, we must have the element of faith. Romans chapter 4, the Bible talks about walking in steps in footsteps of faith. Now think about that, walking in footsteps of faith. That tells me that those footsteps are there, and I'm walking in those footsteps. I'm not making the footsteps. I'm walking in someone else's footsteps, someone that was of great faith. And one of the illustrations that, that he uses in, uh, in Romans chapter 4 here is that of Abraham. Abraham was called the father of our faith. Here's what it says in Romans chapter 4, verse 19. Remember, God made a promise to, uh, of, uh, of a son. It says, Abraham did not focus on his own impotence and say, it's hopeless. This hundred-year-old body could never father a child, nor did he survey Sarah's decades of infertility and give up. He didn't tiptoe around God's promises, asking cautiously skeptical questions. He plunged into the promise and came up strong and ready for God, sure that God would make good on what he had said. The The NIV there says, being fully persuaded. He was fully persuaded. The the ESV says fully convinced. Abraham was fully persuaded. He was fully convinced of that. So what is it? So so that is why it said Abraham was declared fit. Other translation says he was declared righteous because of his belief, because of his faith. Before God, by trusting him, God set him right. But this, but here's I love this part, but this is not just for Abraham. I love verse 24. Listen to this. It's for us also. This is for you and I also. The same thing gets said about us when we embrace and believe, when we have faith in God, the one who brought Jesus to life when the conditions were equally hopeless. We had the same power on the inside of us. The same thing. When we walk in that kind of faith, where we take God at his word and we believe it. Listen, of course, there, there's other characters in the Bible that we can follow as well. We can follow... Um, Paul, Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. Imitate me as I imitate Christ. You imitate me. And really, other people should be able to follow our footsteps. You know, it's not just people in the Bible that we see footsteps. Uh, Polly, Polly Mills, was I think she's known. She she passed away a couple of weeks ago. She was known in this church. She was known not only in this church, but outside of this church. People knew her as a woman of faith. Man, she was strong in faith. Believe in God. I mean, not only did she love God, not only was that evident, but her faith was evident. She prayed for many of you in this church over the years. <clears throat> but your faith, your faith will help you walk through disappointment. But here's the thing about faith. You've got to understand what faith is. If I ask you, well, what, what, what is faith? You know, sometimes people, because they've, they've read the Bible, you know, they'll, well, you know, Hebrews 11, Hebrews 11, 1 says, now faith is, the, uh, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Is that right? Now explain that to me. Well, it's the, you know, it's the substance. It's substance is things, and it's the substance of thing, those things that, that I hope for, and it's the, it's the evidence, you know, just, you know what evidence is. You, you've, been, you've seen the evidence. It's, it's the evidence of, of things not not seen yet you know you know what i'm saying so that's what faith is but we have to know we have to know what faith is and we know what faith is because we just read what faith is abraham you go back to go back to those verses that we just read and and being sure that god will make it's being faith is being fully persuaded it's being fully convinced that's what faith is faith is you are fully convinced now there must, obviously must be some different levels of faith because you know what? I heard that and I believe it. I believe it and I think it'll work. That's not being fully convinced. It's being fully convinced when we take something, whether it's for healing or finances or for peace or whatever it is, we must believe that, it is, that it's there. Um, then so so again, not only knowing what faith is, how does faith come? Now most of you know that, right? How does faith come? 
Yes, you got it. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Romans 10, 17. That's what it says. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. But do you know something else, the way that faith comes? It comes by hearing people's testimony, by hearing people's story, how God came through. If you'll ever, if you'll ever notice this, a, a, a person that is used uh, greatly in, in the healing uh, ministry, um, when they come in, they come in. We've had people through here that God has used them greatly. In that. Uh, Joe Morris. Uh, Joe Morris is one. Some of you don't remember Joe. It's been a while since Joe's been here, but other people that, that God uses. Uh, if you'll watch them when they're given their uh, uh, ministry time, they're, they're, you know, I remember back when I was up in Indiana, there's this woman, and she had, this, yeah, had her hands, her, her, her fingers were but like this, and literally we prayed for her, and her fingers grew out right there. There was another lady that I was at when I was in Wisconsin, da, 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 and they're telling you about all of these things that happened. You know what they're doing? They're building your faith up. They're telling you about things that God has done that they've seen, they've witnessed firsthand done. So again, we need to, faith comes by hearing, and that's why your story is so important. You have a story. Every one of you, have, if you're born again, you have a story. Brian, up here today, when he was giving the announcements, he was telling a great story of when God came in him and got a hold of him. And that, was that Camaro? Huh? 88, baby. But again, you have a story to tell. And we have a place on our website, on our, coming on our new website, for your story to tell. We want to catch your stories. Just something simple. Like when, God got, when, God, when God came through for you, was what, when people watch those stories, it helps build their faith. That's how, again, that's how faith comes. Thirdly, this, the third thing that we must know about faith is faith has to be released. We can't just, you know, read the Bible and get faith and get faith and get faith, but we never activate the faith. I like this verse in, in James. It says this, you know that under pressure your faith life is forced into open and show its true colors. See, it's when we have problems and pressure comes on us, then we get to see all that faith that we talk about and we teach about. Let's see how we walk through it now. Let's see if we're really fully convinced. Are we fully persuaded? Again, it shows our, we get to show our true colors when that happens. And the fourth thing is this. And this is so important. You must feed your faith. You must feed your faith regularly. You must feed your faith often. You know, sometimes if you just say regular, people say, well, I, I regularly feed it twice a year. You know, I come to church. I come to church. I come to church regularly. It's every, every Easter. I mean, like clockwork, I'm always there. And on Christmas, I, man, those, I'm, I'm regular every time. I'm like, no, it's often. It's regular, but it has to be often. We must feed our faith. That doesn't mean go get something new, but it means go back and strengthen that belief. You heard that God's a healer. You heard that he's a healer. He's a healer. And so you've taken that. You believe that. Now strengthen that belief over and over. You keep adding to it. Why? Because it just leaks. We need to strengthen our faith often. And so when we feed our faith, when we feed our faith, when we're obeying and walking in it, Again, then faith comes, then our faith can grow stronger. Listen, if we've done, if we've done, uh, if we have done, uh, let me, what did I write there? Hold on. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. It, it was all jumbled up there for a second. If we've done everything, we've gotten the faith, we're doing all this thing, but we're not releasing it. You know what James says our faith is? He says it's DOA. It's dead on arrival. You could have, you could have mountain moving faith, but if you never walk in it, what good is it? It's dead. It's as good as dead, so James tells us to go out and do this. Listen, your faith, your faith plays a major role. Your faith plays a major role in you receiving the things that you receive from God. The Bible says in Hebrews eleven six 6, says that when we come to God, we must believe that he is, that he is what? He's a reward of those who diligently seek him. When you come to God, you must believe that he is whatever you're coming to him for. You must be fully persuaded. Did you hear me? You must be fully persuaded that he's able to. If you're coming to him for, for healing, you must believe that he is your healer. If you're coming to him because, because I, God, I just, I'm, just, there's, I'm going through this mess at work, and I, I just, I'm worried and stuff, God, I just need peace. You better believe that he is Jehovah Shalom. God, I just need to know you're there. You need to know that he is Jehovah Shama, the God who's always there. He is your righteousness. He's your sanctifier. He's your banner. He's your protection. When whatever, whatever we pray, whatever we go to him for, we need to know and be fully convinced that he is those things. And if we're not fully convinced, then what do we need to do? We need to go back to step four and feed that faith. Paul went back to the church after being stoned, after being stoned in Lystra and Derby. After he got healed up, he went back there, and it tells us exactly why he went back. He said to strengthen the beliefs of the believers. 
Because see, Paul knew that those, those early Christians, they got saved in very turbulent times. It was great persecution. And he knew if they were going to make it through, that their beliefs were going to have to be strengthened. We need to strengthen our faith and be fully devoted, fully devoted to, to those things. <clears throat> sometimes, sometimes we just we need to have something to hang our faith on. We need to hang our faith on something. It's, ama- it's amazing, it's amazing what, what a person's faith will do for them, again, when they learn how to walk in those things. And, you know, one of the things that in our discipleship training that we're, we'll be teaching our disciples is that we've discovered that there's four things that are important for new believers to do. And, this, they, and that's this, that they, first they learn how to pray. They learn how to study the Bible. They learn how to, the importance of not only attending church, but getting involved in the church. And the fourth thing is that they learn to tell their story. But that first thing is that they learn how to pray. And most people, when you talk about learning how to pray, they'll say, well, I've, learned, I've, I've been praying for years. I've been asking God things for years. But prayer is so much more than asking God for things. There's different types of prayer and different rules that go with different prayer. We need to know those. People say, well, I just pray and God knows my heart. Yeah, God does know our heart, but he expects us to grow and he expects us to mature in these things. So one of the things that we do is when we learn to pray, can you imagine teaching that's so important to teach a new believer to pray and pray specifically? You know, don't, don't just pray, don't teach them to pray, well, Lord, just help me to have, pray that this week that the Lord help you have a good day. Well, what's a good day? I mean, a good day for you it might be something different, God's idea of what, what a good day is. You know, that accident that a person maybe had got in, and they were talking to the police officer, or they were talking to the person they were in the accident with while they were waiting on the police to get there, and actually, <coughs> actually <coughs> led them to the Lord. And so to you, is having an accident a good day? No. Is leading somebody to the Lord having a good day? In eternity's conspect, you know what? That turned into a good day. God works all things for the good of those who love God and called according to his purpose. <coughs> but listen, <coughs> we need to... We need to walk in our faith, ex- use our faith. Uh, let me, I, I want to transition to something um, about an opportunity that we have here to, to use our faith in our finances here. But first I want to tell you about a story. When I was in a, a church in Ohio, we, I taught this class. It was called Christ the Healer. It's an amazing class. It was based on um, F.F. F. Bosworth's book called Christ the Healer. I encourage anybody to get that book. I don't know if it's out of print. You can still find them, though. It's, it's an awesome, awesome book. It will give you, it'll ground you in the healing power of God. Well, I was teaching that class, and the books cost $10. And uh, the, so all the, the people in the class had to buy the books. And there was this one lady, and I knew her, and I, I knew kind of her MO. Uh, she, you know, was just that kind that in the church very seldom did she pay for things because, well, she just didn't have it. You know, I, I can't, do you have to pay for this and stuff? And so I told her, I said, yeah, these books are, t-. so she came up to, to get the book for me to give her the book. And I said, I'll tell you what, instead of me giving you the book today, I said, let's, uh, and some, this is going to sound hard to somebody, but I said, let's believe God. Let's believe God for $10. You guys said, you got $10 faith? She said, oh, yeah, yeah. I said, well, let's believe God that this week, this week, not next week, not in a month from now, this week, that God is going to, you're going to get supernatural. Somehow you're going to get $10 that you didn't expect. She said, okay. So we prayed that way, and I didn't give her the book. I said, I'll get, we'll get, you, get, you can buy the book next week. And she came back the next week, and I'm telling you what, she was glowing. She came in, she says, here's my $10. I said, well, where'd you get that? She said, you're not going to believe it. I found it. <laughs> I just found $10. I, she said, I've never found money in my life, but I found it. And here's my, I want to buy, pay for my book. And I'm telling you, that did more for her than if I had given her the book like she had received everything, and that helped her in that. 